So now I'd like to invite the speakers to come join us. Um, and we're going to spend a little bit of time um, inviting them to respond to one another. Um, so, let's settle. Um, I think we can start maybe in the order in which the presentations have taken place. Would you, I mean, if you, um, I'm okay. I mean, if you want to, however you would like. Um, I should, I should sit. Um, so let's start with Andrea. This was very interesting, very uh, complementary as well as um, divergent, I think. So let's, let's start with that. Um, go ahead. No, let's do it. Um, well, thank you very much. This was really, really um, an honor to be on this particular constellation, uh, on this panel with this particular constellation of papers. Um, I think it's really interesting that we were tasked with thinking about locating the political, and all three of us um, um, are, are working on environmental issues and the forms of sort of dispossession, um, the land grabs and water grabs, um, that are ongoing and that are bringing forth um, sort of a proliferation of different kinds of political moments. Um, so I think that's interesting and relevant um, to see that I think that that is where some of the contradictions are emerging. That is where a certain kind of um, uh, extremely um, politicized terrain, um, and, and it's not emerging. I mean, this has obviously been gone ongoing for many decades, but I think there's a way in which um, things are sort of heightened um, at the moment and will. Um, so in terms of maybe just quickly responding to uh, Craig's paper, I thought it was very, very interesting to precisely think about um, politics as demanding and relying on the eventfulness um, or, or the event in Rancière's terms. So um, as you said, the, sort of the disruption of the sensible, the scandal in thinking and so on. Um, but that in fact, um, a lot of politics has to unfold uh, on the level of chronicity, meaning that, for example, uh, the problem of toxicity and pollution is one that um, 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 is non-eventful, uneventful, uh, in the sense that it, it's a slow, seeping, long durée um, of, of um, kind of pollution that your people are actually dealing with. Um, so that's a very particular political terrain to deal with. I think it's, I would love to talk more with you about the relationship between the chronic and the eventful in how to make politics. Um, but it also raises a very interesting question of whether courts are the terrain upon which um, these long-term forms of, um, um, uh, um, in this case, a dispossession of health, the right to health, I guess it would be, um, can actually be even fought. Uh, and your answer, of course, was courts are profoundly, and the law is actually profoundly unable to deal with issue, uh, things that are non-eventful. Um, and I think that's an interesting question also. Well, what then? And then I think your paper points precisely towards, on the one hand, I mean, I guess your paper points towards, on the one hand, people going to the ports, uh, the courts. That's what we call the judicialization of politics. I mean, there's a reason why people go to the courts, because precisely the political sphere, political parties have been captured by special interests, their particular risks. It's what I call the law of the few. Um, uh, uh, so particular, uh, particularist interests um, captured by global finance or whatever. Um, so people still go to the courts, which are often, however, profoundly unaffectful, or they turn to other modes of radical action, be it vigil their own kind of militias, their own kind of vigilantism. And interestingly, that's actually also something um, that uh, has been quite important to my own work on the politics of anti-water privatization. So last week, I spent 10 days in Ireland. On the first day, I went to a court case um, against water activists who were being criminalized for their protests. And the rest of the time, I spent with essentially 
women who were engaged in sort of low-scale guerrilla activities uh, where they sabotage infrastructure, um, water meters and things like that, so they're taking them out of the ground. Um, and so the, the level at which politics is, is happening has uh, uh, that, that sort of low-scale counter-insurgency that you refer to, I think, is another terrain that will only expand, uh, in my view. And I was surprised to find so much of it in Europe as well, um, people sabotaging... Um, and the role of the media is so important here. So one thing I was doing with these water activists was looking at their Facebook pages with them and looking at how they circulate their own videos that they make of their own counterinsurgency guerrilla activities and them then sort of uh, engaging in what they talk about as this thrill of watching themselves and seeing others watching them engaging in counterinsurgency. So the role of media, I think, is another ter political terrain that's leading to you know, these feedback loops and this proliferation of different kinds of, be it violent vigilantism, sabotage, and those kinds of things. Um, so those are the, the, the connections that I saw there that were quite profound and interesting. Wow. Um, <laughs> I. I can't think on my feet nearly as eloquently as that, um, but <laughs> but I think that was um, that did pick up a couple of the, the interesting cross-cutting themes. So I think one of the reasons environment might be coming out, but also coming out in relation to this kind of this this low-level stuff, is because it's one of those locations where um, those of us who are kind of invested in it really after 10, 15 years of thinking about it, it just seems to get harder and harder to figure out how to, how to address these things. So, so I think there's, there, there's something in the way that each one of us has brought up the kind of trap that we see, um, that we see actually tightening around environmental and political issues. Um, and, then, and then trying to sort of creatively think outside of it. So whether it's uh, th thinking through things, thinking through low-level counterinsurgency, or thinking through this play mode, which I, which I really loved, um, as, a, as a way of kind of disrupting on the margins of official politics, um, I, think is, I think is part of the, the move that we're, all, um, that we're all making. And I think, um, you know, in, in relation to the judicialization of politics, which is a very Latin American way of, of dealing with some of the problems with official politics. Um, it's true, it's not, uh, it, it's not very effective on its own terms, but I think one of the things that, uh, that I'm trying to show, and I, and I actually think this, this um, is what both of you are doing in different ways in your own projects, is um, that it can be effective in other surprising ways. And, so, and, and that, to me, is one of the things that anthropology is, is potentially really well positioned for, is to, is to watch the ways that um, these potentially ineffective forms of, or, or, or obviously ineffective forms of, of activism and of work um, actually have these strange long durée kind of um, eddies and effects of their own. Um, and so, so certainly that's what, that's what draws me to, uh, to the, these kinds of things where we're actually in, in, in in the soy conflict or the environmental conflict, one could, one could point to a lot more events and one could point to a lot more obviously political things. What really interests me is those things that are really on the margins where people are feeling uncomfortable. There's clearly a, dis, you know, there's a disruption in the force going on for everybody involved that points to a possibility of some kind of, a, a, of emergence coming out of that. Um, I find it really interesting to think um, through both your papers in terms of uh, the temporality of the judicialization of politics or the idea that lawfare, you know, when the comrades talk about the lawfare being a particular moment of neoliberal um, politics uh, and how the resort to lawfare uh, might connect to uh, both the way that legal institutions are set up. So for instance, in um, the US, if you have uh, particular courts being um, described you know, by particular periods, so certain courts are liberal, certain, you know, the Warren co Court was liberal, this court was, is not gonna be, or whatever. Uh, but I think one of the problems is that um, it, just sort of looking at how law might work uh, in particular fields, uh, doesn't give us a purchase on how easily that can be swept away by new kinds of precedents and um, also by changes in the structure of the courts and 
the way that the courts themselves are part of national emotions. And uh, increasing, you know, if in India over the last, say, um, 10 years was, the last 10 years was a period when people were going to court, when there was a sense that the courts were active on a variety of different social issues. Now, again, you have an increasingly erratic court um, giving kind of sometimes hyper-nationalist judgments, sometimes uh, the only judgments that are going to save the country, apparently. Uh, you know, so there's a range in which, uh, a ways in which one needs to think about the court itself. We open it up and then you can respond. Um, yeah, I think that that, that could work. So, um, questions, question, comments. Um, um, I think the translator will need um, to hear it. Um, I'm just thinking in the context sort of the, the terminology of the low intensity fascism and some of the general sort of approaches that uh, anthropologists with sort of a left liberal um, inclination tend to focus our ethnographic research on progressive movements or sort of subaltern struggles. But to what extent at the, the present moment it might be important to, to switch it around and maybe for example the ethnography of like RSS militias. Um, or kind of the, the, the Trump voter base and such like that, where maybe we need to shift away from our comfort zone, the kinds of uh, uh, movements that we're attracted to and focus on um, those other sides, the supporters of the low intensity fascism. Thank you. No, I think that's really important because um, it's, it's also, it's important to do ethnography because you realize it's not just about bad people, but about people who might actually be very loving um, and very warm in other aspects of their life. So I did some research um, with RSS schools and RSS hostels for indigenous children. And you can see why people are so attracted to them because they're a means of both um, actually accessing education as well as uh, providing that warm, fuzzy family feeling that comes with being part of a larger movement. Uh, so I think, you know, it's extremely important to do field work, um, ethnographic field work with people that you don't necessarily start off liking. And you don't necessarily end up disliking, but you know they're fascist. Uh, yeah, I think the answer answer is absolutely yes. Uh, that was very unequivocally, I think, one of the responses uh, at the last AAA, the American Anthropological Association, which happened, of course, right after the Trump win, where, um, you know, anthropologists were sort of uh, walking around completely dazed uh, because many of them themselves hadn't predicted what would happen. Uh, and so one of the, I think major consensuses that came out of the AAA was that we need to radically shift uh, our um, field of vision uh, and turn towards precisely these kinds of uh, uh, groups, uh, move out of our comfort zone, as you said. The other thing that was said was that there were tons of surveys that were done uh, uh, and, and no one predicted the win of Trump, which also shows um, the profound poverty of not just surveys, but big data profound poverty. And so one of the things that a lot of people at the AAA said was, you know, that's exactly where our so-called small data, I actually hate that distinction, I think it's bullshit, but you know what I mean. Our ethnographic method is precisely the kind of method that, are actually, that can actually illuminate, um, you know, the kinds of politics uh, uh, that are going on um, elsewhere. And so there was talk of building archives, of, you know, sending out students, uh, uh, organizing classes that do serious ethnographic research in, you know, rural communities. So my sense is that our American colleagues are doing a lot of that work already, and we should frankly be doing this here in Canada as well. Canada is not immune to these tendencies. And so it would behoove us, to use that term, <laughs> to, to, to do that here as much as in America and elsewhere, I think. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I totally agree with that. And, and I, think, I think for those of us who are doing political work, it, this, uh, this problem becomes even kind of magnified in the sense that so much of the kind of ethnography that all of us are engaged in are also, we're also engaged in some way in the, in the struggles that we support. And so, uh, and, and sometimes as public intellectuals as well, which makes it that much more difficult to access 
the, uh, the opposition um, ethnographically, right? So this is certainly something that I have, uh, I've struggled with a lot in, in my work. And it, but frankly, it's one of the things that makes a move to, um, to sort of other terrain, like, like things, like plants, um, uh, quite useful. So, so I can, um, it, it took a little while for me to figure this out, but when, um, when I was very closely associated with um, these movements, uh, in, in Paraguay, it was, it was hard for me to figure out how to crack um, soy farmers as ethnographic interlocutors. Whereas once I started talking about soy, um, that opened up these really wonderful uh, conversations. Um, and, that's, uh, and, and it also opened up a series, it, it complexified the field so much um, for me. It's very easy, and, and most people who work in this area in, in, uh, in Paraguay will do this. You can arrive there, find your community, and get one version of the story very easily um, as to what's going on. As soon as you start to break that out, it becomes more complex, and you realize, because it's more complex, you also realize why it's so difficult to regulate, why it's so difficult to do anything about it politically, um, because the, the, the simple story actually makes it seem like there's simple answers to that. Um, so I, I think all of these ways of, of sort of shifting outside of the, uh, of, of the official political streams is one way to open up these other kinds of uh, communities, but it's certainly something we have to push a lot on, and I think, I think students is a good place to start. So. Sorry, I just quickly wanted to add that in my particular case with the water movement, I now, for simplicity's sake, represented it as a leftist movement. Um, but in fact, um, it's completely on many levels uh, indeterminate and the one political party that is still sort of steadfastly fighting against the privatization of water in Italy is a populist movement that is highly indeterminate in terms of its politics. So it's anti-privatization, um, but is also very xenophobic. And that was one of the sort of uncomfortable surprises to me is that you go in thinking, oh my God, this is about this radical re you know, redefinition of property, but that doesn't mean anything politically anymore today. And I think it's these kinds of ind political indeterminacies also that we're encountering increasingly anyway in the field, maybe particularly when it comes to environmental struggles. I don't know. Yeah, I just want to add to that, that uh, one of the fronts of the RSS, the Swadeshi Jagran Manch, is one of the sort of um, strongest anti-capital, anti-foreign investment kind of fronts. And, uh, you know, they would be against the privatization of uh, various things like water. But the problem is the connection between that kind of political stance and enable... So that would attract a lot of people who would then uh, also buy into their other kind of fascist, anti-minority leanings. So how do you actually deal with the sort of complex, contradictory politics of um, what we now see as old fascism. Thank you. Um, questions, comments? Um, there are multiple ones. There's two up here and one right here. So let's start above. Thank you for your patience. Hi, uh, thank you for extremely interesting discussions of the political and raising a lot of questions. Um, I guess my overall question is each of these separate uh, battles maybe have two sides, you know, they become murky. I think Nandini just said a little bit and uh, Craig said the same thing. I. I I think that we need to take, that one way that we maybe need to address this is not to stay in the level of, you know, which way is the privatization of water going or how are these toxic chemicals understood? Because there have been eras in which, I just know mostly the US, eras in which when the unions stood up for this long, slow, chronic problem, EPA was formed, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health was formed in a, in a political era that had progressive movements. So I wonder whether we want to 
be as confused or adopt a level of confusion and not look more as Nandini did as the overall atmosphere of fascism and repression that allows or that distorts the alternate facts and you know the fact that the pharmaceuticals are slowly killing people. These issues, or the fact that privatization of water can also become a nationalist issue. So I think that as anthropologists, we not only need to go down and see all the different perspectives, we also have to have some faith in an ability to analyze the larger political context. And I think without that, we are going to be a little bit confused and adopting the confusion of the people that, you know, different perspectives, where in fact, we might be under the necessity of recognizing a general move towards I don't know, pre-figurative fascism in some places and whatever other words you want to look at, and how that then affects all of these different issues that we're studying. Who would like to go first? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that we don't want to lose sight of that. And I also, I also totally agree with, the, with the, that everything is messy and complex line in anthropology can get a little tiresome and ineffective um, at some level. Uh, I, I just, I guess part of what I'm, what I'm saying though is that the, you know, these are fights that are fought on multiple fronts and the tools that we bring to the table I think are the ones that, um, that lend a little bit more to that, that kind of that kind of uh, description of things. So uh, to, to be very clear in, in my case, my whole project is motivated by, um, by looking at regulatory failure in, um, in Paraguay, uh, which, which starts with this government that comes in, a leftist government that comes in with a whole bunch of really gung-ho, really smart activists who say, okay, this is, this is it. We have the opportunity to fix this problem and we're gonna regulate the crap out of soy and we're going to solve this. And it is a complete disaster. And, and the reason, one of the reasons it's such a disaster, I think, is because the line that they come into this with um, completely fails to understand the complexity of the situation that they're, that they're confronting. And so then you have you know, a, a, an electoral cycle in which you've got very little time in order to, to, to work something like this out. And basically, when that had to be worked out was in the decade preceding that government coming into power, those people had to be thinking in much more complicated terms about what regulation was and what the objects were that they were trying to regulate. Um, they simply didn't have the time, and, and on year four, you know, about six months before they were thrown out in a coup, um, they, they, they suddenly started to go, okay, this is, <laughs> it's gonna sound like Trump, but this is more complicated than we thought it was gonna be, right? Um, suddenly, all those, uh, all those things come crashing down, and, and that's why I do think there's, there is a long-term um, worth in the kind of work that we do, which is about kind of pushing that, that complexity totally in solidarity with, with this kind of thing. So, um, and, and you're, you're talking about this kind of long-term stuff makes, uh, and in relation to those moments uh, in which the EPA came in and OSHA came in and so on. Um, makes me think one of, the, one of the crazy things that's going on in the soy industry right now is that DDT is making a comeback, right? Um, and so if you think about what the long-term long -term game is there, um, yes, there was, there was a short, there was a short term backlash against the, the apparent excesses of the Green Revolution the first time around. Um, but the Green Revolution is still going on and it's still slowly seeping into things. So how is that even possible? How is it that DDT, how is it that can, we can be creating now, a, you know, DDT resistant uh, uh, versions of crops and the understanding that DDT is now going to make this big comeback in agriculture of all things um, makes me think that we're, that most of us are kind of missing what the game is when we talk about it in polarized terms and we talk about it in, in, in um, in these sort of macro things. There's, there's a lot more control going on over how we define these substances um, at this small level, and we need to get savvy about that, I think. 
No, I did take your point about sort of long-term processes and needing to look at those, but I was just wondering if we might look at the role of politics in relationship to structure an event and the power of the event or the power of a particular moment to overturn long-term structures and reconfigure those structures. Because, for instance, if you were an anthropologist studying um, syncretic relationships between Hindus and Muslims, you could actually study that uh, for a long period and establish the fact that there have been interrelationships of all kinds and suddenly there is a communal riot and all of that gets swept away. Right? or something happens and long-term structures change. Um, so the power of politics to act as an event and to overturn a long-term structure is something that I think we need to be um, quite attentive to. So uh, there was a, a question above. Um, can, um, can you raise your hand again? Uh, there was somebody up there, no? No one else? Um, then I'm going to uh, pass the mic over to, to Drew. I also really uh, enjoyed the, the three papers a lot and have been thinking about them in some of the ways you've already been talking about. But the one thing that I would love to maybe hear your reflections about, um, it struck me, Craig, when you were talking about um, that, that the farmers can no longer speak about certain things without a bit of discomfort. Right, that there's something kind of underlying disturbed that their sense of, you know, of how they think about the world. And then it, it got me thinking a little bit about maybe the pleasure of making law and staging the referenda. And you also talked a bit about the pleasures involved in maybe some of this kind of vigilanteism. And I'm wondering if there's something about our impatience to search for effects and to get at effects in thinking about the political that we kind of rush past these, this kind of the charge, the emotional charge of these particular acts. Um, and so I'm wondering if there might be a way to locate the political to some degree in, in those in thinking about, yeah, the, you know, I don't know, structures of feeling or, or emotions. Um, and I think that when we think about court cases, those tend to be those moments where we are rushing to think effects, right? Like, what, where, where is this, what's the verdict gonna be, and then what are the implications, rather than kind of dwelling in, yeah, the, the kind of the pleasures of, uh, you know, and they can be, <laughs> that's a multivalent, right? They can be the pleasures of, of uh, you know, maybe hanging somebody um, versus, versus and, and so I just would love to hear some reflections about that maybe. No, I totally agree with you, and there is, I mean, perhaps that's why there's such a sort of large-scale turn to affect um, as a mechanism for understanding politics. And uh, in my earlier work on counterinsurgency, uh, I've actually been looking at um, how civil wars are actually emotional wars and uh, the kind of emotional conscription that is required uh, both to engage in a war as well as the kind of uh, affective outcomes of the war. So I completely agree that it's impossible to think today about politics outside of affect and emotion. And Yeah, in, in the sense that their own interests is the wrong frame to understand that, right? So it's a, it's a two-way misrecognition of, of, of what's going on there. Um, yeah, I definitely feel, and I think this is, this is so true of environment. I mean, if you think about what Silent Spring does at the moment um, when, when it is eventful, um, it is very much about, it's, it's an effective reorganization of how people think about agriculture. Um, and, and so, uh, so I've been, uh, I, I like looking for those, those things that are apparently banal, and even like when I talk about this disturbance that people feel, it, it's really, it's, it's hard to note sometimes. It's sort of a posture thing, or these little, these little caveats and these asides, but it's clearly there, and it's clearly about how people have been forced in one way or another to, to, to reorganize their thinking. And those, those things do have long-term effects, but not in the way that one would be able to predict or plan out. 
Um, I would just wanted to add um, that I think those of us who are studying politics and political movements on the quote-unquote left or the quote-unquote right or whatever, um, I mean, it's very obvious that all of us are paying a lot of attention to media and affect and the way in which um, we, you know, who, ha you know, our discipline has a long history of studying social movements, um, but I don't think really we've even begun to theorize um, the way, uh, the, the question of mediation here. Uh, and we've begun to understand, uh, and there's, of course, a lot of writing also on, you know, the different kinds of revolutions, the Egyptian revolution, the road of Twitter, and all of that. But I think from an anthropological um, sort of uh, perspective, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to some really serious kind of thinking about how uh, movements are organized and potentiated through um, media and, and precisely the affective experience of watching people killing each other or sabotaging me water meters or whatever it is. Um, there is some talk on this, if you think about Maple Raza's work, and he's uh, talked about alter-globalization uh, activists and riot porn, uh, so the sort of pornographic pleasure in watching, you know, the black bloc beat up the police and vice versa, and they watch it over and over and over again. And surprisingly, you know, I'm encountering the same thing with these, you know, these women who talk about the thrill, and they do this collectively. Uh, so they come together in groups, dress in black, like SWAT teams, they said, and take out meters in the, you know, in the working class neighborhoods in Dublin. Um, but and, and then you can also see and track on Facebook that these videos themselves are being watched by thousands and tens of thousands of other people. Um, and, you know, you know, so a theory of affect and, and how it's mediated through new social media and potentiated and create certain kinds of collective effervescence that, of course, you know, the, and cre create, I guess, certain forms of political collectivity um, that are lacking uh, uh, in the quote-unquote, um, not the real world, that's not the right term, but you know, in the in, in, in world outside of media is an interesting question. Um, so I think we have a lot of work to do there as well. WhatsApp is also, why did I join WhatsApp? It's because all the activists are constantly circulating this. I wouldn't have thought to. I know. I know it's super useful, but I'm just saying I joined it only because of the activists, and now, of course, I use it all the time. But. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? So um, I, I was thinking about using uh, my own kind of uh, position as the co-organizer of this plenary to actually ask two questions. And um, I uh, want to let you know that when we construed this um, invitation, this, this abstract that's been leading us today, um, Brexit hadn't happened. Trump hadn't happened, uh, so we, we, you know, we, you know, these questions are now gaining a new kind of urgency. And I, I was struck by the ways in which um, all of you were talking in, in, about the, in different ways about being in a kind of a state of emergency. So I, I have two questions, and one of them is a bit dark, and another one is a bit less dark. So, so let, let me, I don't know which one you'd like to go with first, but perhaps I was struck by, we, we asked the question about um, what happens to older political languages and, and sort of how are they perhaps mobilized in some way or transformed um, to respond to a new set of circumstances. And I was really struck in two papers very explicitly by the specter of fascism, right? And, and I wondered um, if we could talk a little bit about that, about um, the, uh, some of the possibilities and, and perhaps also limits inherent in reviving that language and that mode of critique. And then in relation to that, I would like to know is there a way in which we can move towards a kind of an anti-fascism, a contemporary anti-fascism, a kind of an anti-fascism 2.1, and what would that in fact involve? And this is echoing some of the questions about the sense of where do we stand politically as a discipline. Um, and my second question has to do in part, is inspired in part by um, Andrea's um, really interesting um, argument um, and her um, uh, sort of uh, the, the, the beginning of the paper, which is very seriously deals with play, right? And I, I'm somebody who also works on kind of experimental forms of political action and have been thinking about play quite a bit. Um, and it's, it, I was thinking also the ways in which the kind of turn uh, to play um, mimics in some ways um, the other 
children of the kind of non-referential turn in politics, which, for example, is the post-truth, right? The whole kind of idea of the alternative facts and so forth. And um, I was wondering if we could speak about that because you were also um, talking a great deal about how there is no predetermined content to any of these new kind of experiments with referenda, with extra kind of the, with the um, um, what are they called? Executive orders, right? That these these experiments um, of, with locating politics elsewhere actually do not have a pre-existing content. And I was wondering if there's something more structural shifting in the nature of our political culture and, and language itself that is in fact enabling these kinds of transformations. So um, that's plenty, I think, and I'll, you know, whoever would like to go first is, um, you know, let me know. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was, I was kind of struck by, um, by that as well, and I, I think the, but it, by the, yeah, the fascism part of it, the way that that's arising and the way that it's sort of front of mind for so many of us. Um, and it's uh, both of these things actually, so sort of latent or emergent fascism and post-truth, I've been thinking about in relation to Paraguay and having a lot of trouble, trouble locating it. And I think one of the, one of the reasons that I'm having trouble with it um, is because uh, they seem to, they both are symptoms of a crisis in liberalism. Um, and anthropologists have been very good, uh, in, including many of us here, have been very good at criticizing liberalism for a long time, right? So, so we, uh, there's this, there's been this move to, um, to kind of, I don't know what the word is, but, but, you know, take the piss out of liberalism a little bit. And in part, that's about, uh, that's about criticizing its representational politics, um, this kind of the, the transparency politics on which truth and, and therefore post-truth play. Um, uh, but then also the, the kinds of um, insipid uh, elite politics that, that emerge in the guise of, of liberalism against which certain kinds of fascism are absolutely a, uh, a, 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 an answer. So I think... Um, I think that's the that's the space that we're playing in, and I think it's a I think it's a space that we have to be really careful in figuring out um, where we, how we even how we even talk about it. I don't think you know the standing on the side of the barricade that has a capital T truth is is a, a useful position for any of us to be in, um, given where we've been for the last couple of decades. But then figuring out what, where you stand in relation to that is, um, uh, is, is difficult as well. So that's. Do you want to? Um, with regards to older political language, um, I mean, when you look at the European scene and the recent elections, um, it's very, very clear that uh, mainstream political parties um, that have existed uh, for the bulk of the 20th century that built the welfare state and then dismantled it, Christian Democrats, uh, Social Democrats, are broken. Um, and in, in Italian, that would be the, what used to be the, the very, very large Communist Party. And that, of course, the, the pattern that's emerging is candidates emerging on the far right and the far left. Uh, well, far left, you know, whatever, that are... Um, kind of, I'm thinking now about the Austrian elections, but also the Italian scene. Um, scene is a little bit different in France, but the breakup of the hegemony of um, uh, the large political parties, I think, is a pattern that we can see, at least in the European case. Um, that also means that what is lost is a whole arsenal, a whole lexicon, a political lexicon that organized political life uh, in the 20th century in Europe. Um, or at least it's not thought of as, you know, useful anymore. Um, so um, what I encountered mostly was a sense of uh, in intense crisis, crisis of liberalism, crisis of capitalism, and this attempt, um, and again, this, these are incomplete forms, and of course, you know, a lot of people who are still active in unions are part of these movements as well, for example. Um, but um, the, the, the point about play that I wanted to mention is that, at least in the Italian case, uh, my sense was um, that new kinds of political languages almost need to be invented in order to account for these two intersecting crises um, that are rocking Europe right now and also America to some degree, I think. 
Um, hence the language of the commons, hence lawyers seriously, as in studious play, trying to think about what it would mean to actually create a legal lexicon that really doesn't quite fit with, you know, the legal architecture that we have worked with in Italy um, for the last, you know, 150 years. Um, I think maybe I'll hand it over to Mom. Yeah, you know, in a way, I think um, we may be overstating the newness of crisis because if you go back to the 30s, um, in Germany, uh, you know, there was precisely this kind of sense of crisis of political parties and uh, actually across the world at that time, there was a sense that uh, politics needed to be renewed. But to come to this question of um, play and mimicking certain forms of legality, I don't know if you've recall this conversation uh, between Foucault and the Maoists uh, in um, it's this sort of delightful uh, discussion of what juridical forms, uh, the effect of juridical form on the content of uh, the possibility of justice and what it would mean, um, what it means to have a third party as a judge over two contending parties and what that means for the ability of um, the proletariat sort of loosely defined to actually seek justice within a formal legal structure. And uh, one of the ways in which, uh, say for instance in India, people have been taking up environmental issues is having people's tribunals or alternative forms of quasi-judicial, uh, which, you know, space making, which are often uh, headed by former justices, uh, lawyers, etc. But again, this really replicates the power of the judiciary, doesn't necessarily challenge um, the sort of fundamental sense of law as something that is external, third party, and in the post-colonial context, historically imposed. So I'm not sure that law actually offers us a space for play because of the structures that law contains, uh, which have historically been constraining. And the other question that I wanted to raise about play is that, um, in fact, when you have this overarching sense of fascism, people are just too demoralized to play. And the only people who are playing are the fascists. I mean, the innovation is all on their side. Maybe, <laughs> just to not enter that, the reason why I use the term interreg interregnum at the end of my talk is precisely to refer back to the 1930s, the Gramscian term. Um, and of course it was Gramsci who was writing this in the 1920s. So he had no idea what was to come. It would only get worse, as we know. Um, but um, his argument about the interregnum was precisely this, is that uh, on the one hand, it's a time of monsters, and at the same time, the horizons are open, and it's really the only thing that we can do is keep that horizon open, I think. <laughs> and on that lovely note... <laughs>